Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for coming on such a, a rainy morning. Um, yeah, I want to talk uh, today about... Um, it was a bit of a shock to me, by the way, the theme, um, because I've slightly uh, forgotten that one. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> making... Um, I'm going to talk about making learning um, joyful, and I think I, I'm going to be able to theme shock into it, because I've got a um, slightly eccentric middle section to this talk, which uh, uh, you might find quite shocking. So, um, yeah, so I'll give a little bit of, sort of background about how I came to be a grandmaster of memory, which is um, a title which... I've only, the only utility I found for it is in nightclubs um, in the uh, closing hours of the night. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of got into this actually when I was about um, 18. Um, I was in hospital and uh, I had a, a something called reactive arthritis, which is basically your joints swell up because of a virus. And um, I was in a hospital ward with all these octogenarians. Um, and it was just like, it was absolutely mind-blowingly boring because the same conversations would be happening day after day after day. And I was like, oh, goodness. And so I thought, oh, well, it wouldn't be interesting to learn about memory. So a friend bought me a book about um, how to train yourself in memory. And uh, the, the other motivation, actually, was uh, to try to uh, impress the nurses. Um, and uh, anyway, so I soon sort of trained up in these techniques, which are, um, as, as I'll explain, they're very accessible and they're, um, they're deeply disclosive about the kind of broader properties of the mind and perception and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, because um, I ended up practicing it quite a lot, I wound up, um, and in this period of my life, I actually look back on with incredible regret because every, I wound up competing at the World Memory Championships. And um, the thing about the World Memory Championships is that I'd spent all my summers from the age of like 22 to like 28 uh, practicing memorizing binary numbers in a futile bid to beat Dr. Gunter Karsten of Germany, who, um, <laughs> who um, he was the world binary numbers champion. And, um, and uh, there was all sorts of banter. Of course, it's an incredibly boring competition to watch because uh, it's like an exam hall or something. Um, but I, I would be so whispering at him, just going, yeah, I'm going to bring you down, Karsten. I'm going to bring you down. <laughs> um, but anyway, he could, uh, I could, in the end, I learned how to remember 2,300 ones and zeros in order in half an hour. Um, he described this as, um, yeah, really quite shit. Um, he could do 3,200. Um, one of the advantages he had was that his glasses were blacked out on the inside with just two small pinpricks right through the middle of the glasses so that the only information, because of also the noise cancelling headphones that entered his brain, was the binary numbers. Uh, anyway, so that was a sort of, that was kind of a good, good phase. So um, if you want, I can do like a little memory demo. They're quite fun. Um, in which case, I might grab you, if that's all right. Yes, you, yep, yep. Um, just, just, you don't have to remember anything, just go and type a number. <laughs> um, yeah, just, uh, yeah, just type, type a number. Just as many as I want? Yeah, as many as you feel is appropriate, right. given that we've only got 20 minutes. Okay. <laughs> is that enough? No. <laughs> we'll probably do a few more if you like. A few more? Okay, that'll go. Yep. Uh, okay, cool. So, um, so um, yeah, I'm, I'm this, by the way, you may as well, if you've talked to one person once over two minutes, talk to the other person for one minute. I'm going to quickly um, remember this. Uh, you're welcome to do the same if you fancy it. Okay, so, yeah, the number, um, the number is... Um, um, Five six two nine six zero two six um, five five eight four nine zero one two four four three six seven four zero two eight nine zero four. Um, yeah, but, <laughs> and uh, <coughs> uh, and I'll kind of um, explain as a little bit later how I do that. It's not actually terribly difficult. So um, so with um, 
so what I've been kind of working on for the last uh, five years is um, a website and some apps called Memrise, where we've tried to um, kind of bring all the kind of insights and ideas um, found in the kind of the art and sort of science of, of learning and memory into a, a learning experience, which is sort of authentically joyful. Uh, and uh, you know, as I'll describe, one of the most interesting things about these techniques is it's fundamentally... Uh, you know, the kind of fundamental rule of thumb is to bring your imagination into learning and transform whatever might be resistant to learning into a form where it's dazzling and full of vibrancy and life and therefore correspondingly unforgettable. So this is kind of how we began um, with Memorize, which was in kind of teaching of Chinese characters and... Um, uh, and so the, you know, the kind of scenario would be, okay, you know, you're in Beijing, you need to go to the toilet, which toilet door do you go through? And um, unless you're a kind of nihilist and just don't care. Uh, and so, yeah, so this is the character for woman. And so, um, so we have all these kind of images, many of them crowdsourced or memorized, which take the kind of shape of the character and transform it kind of imaginatively into the meaning. Um, and what's quite nice about this, if I, even if I go back, is um, that, um, that after having seen an animation like that, when you subsequently look at the character, it actually changes your perception of the actual character itself and brings a little bit of sort of life and humor into it. Um, and so this is the, um, the character for strength. Um, and so that this particular mnemonic is actually etymological. It shows how the character developed over the years. Um, um, I actually prefer this uh, alternative, um, mem, as we call them. Um, so we've got an enormously strong man. Uh, this is drawn by an artist. Uh, called David Roach, um, and uh, yeah, and then we test you continuously. So active recall of memories is super important. So which of those uh, is woman? Top one, very good. Um, and, and one of the fascinating things about memory is that actually just forcing yourself to go the top one, even though it's super obvious, actually will strengthen that memory much more than if you just kind of quietly in your head going, oh, it's obvious, it's the top one. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and then uh, this is the character for field. And again, we've got a little thing. You know, you can imagine this in any form. And this is a great thing about memory. It's incredibly creative. You can go with it any way you wish. And so this is, uh, you know, a, an amazingly badly drawn field. Um, and, but you could easily be looking out of a window at a field or whatever else. Um, and so the character for male means um, strength uh, in the field, etymologically. Um, and um, uh, this is actually a younger version of me, um, <laughs> epitomizing the quality of maleness. Um, yeah, and so uh, what does that mean? It means <laughs> male. Yeah, good. Did someone just say friend? Um, yeah, um, good. Yeah, and so anyway, so that's how you might learn some, some Chinese characters. So on Memorize, um, we've kind of been elaborating this. And one of the interesting things about a startup is that it's like, um, it's approximately a thousand times more difficult than you imagine it will be at the beginning. Um, and so, um, I, you know, I wish I could have said we accomplished all this in the first three months, but it's taken five years. Um, and we anyway, we've now got this really cool team, and it's super international because we're teaching hundreds of languages. And so if I just go through the team, um, Lynn is a uh, Flemish, and then we got Robin from Germany, Lim from Vietnam, Olivia from Mexico, Jaco from Finland, Oli from England, Connor's Welsh, Diego is Spanish, and Danish, Jacek's Polish, Monaco is Italian, um, and she's really Italian. Edward, what is going on with the Android app? Um, Christina is Estonian, um, that's me, I'm British, uh, says he. Daniel is our CTO, he's from uh, Israel, Nadim's from Bangladesh, Ben, England. Mathieu is uh, very, very French. Huh? Uh, Alan's from China, Marie's from France, Josh is English, uh, Connor's English. Uh, Anna is from uh, Spain, uh, Wojciech is also from Poland, and Diana, who's our filmmaker, and I'm going to show you some of her stuff um, in a bit, is from the Ukraine. Uh, we also have a uh, cat as, um, as uh, chairwoman. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the story behind that is uh, in a dark moment in 2012, uh, uh, I'm not joking, I, I forgot to renew the domain name. And, um, and so Memorize went off, offline for like two days while we scrambled and hoped that someone hadn't bought it. Uh, and so anyway, I was replaced by a popular demand by the cat. Um, <laughs> And so what we have is like a, what we're kind of aiming to create is like a highly visual kind of engaging um, language learning content combined with these kind of scientifically optimized learning games, which um, kind of speed the rate at which you can learn. And um, we've got this kind of amazing crowdsource community of, um, of MEMS, about two million of them. And this is my favorite of all time. Um, El Polvo in Spanish, one of whose meaning is a one night stand. It was only a Polvo because he drove a Volvo. <laughs> El Polvo. And, and the great thing about this is that because it kind of brings um, like imagination and humor and kind of ridiculousness uh, into the thing, you, you end up kind of remembering the word extraordinarily well. It can kind of uh, last, you know, relatively speaking, five or ten times longer. Um, and, um, and it's kind of curious and counterintuitive that in memory and learning, actually having more in your mind 
makes it easier to learn sometimes, which is uh, kind of paradoxical. It's the sort of thing where even though I've had that thought like about 35,000 times, every time I have it again, I'm like, <laughs> um, anyway, um, so some of the other principles of spaced repetition. So we track out all of your, all the things you've learned, and then we remind you according to a kind of an adaptive schedule. We'll remind you after, um, you know, basically five minutes, an hour, a day, a week, a month, a year, because every time you repeat a memory or something you've learned, it gets correspondingly stronger and will last a bit longer. And then the testing effect, um, the, this incredibly lame metaphor for which is the gym, um, is basically that if you practice stuff, you uh, learn it better. And so we have quite a kind of sophisticated infrastructure for delivering different kinds of tests, um, the more difficult the test and the more effort you have to put into learning, uh, to remembering it, the more the corresponding learning is strengthened. And, and so we kind of pull these things together and the result is that we kind of, and this by the way is an independent study, <laughs> which actually if, in all honesty, um, this uh, someone forwarded me from some other startups investor presentation where they had a towering tower on the right hand side. But, um, <laughs> um, um, but that, that bit was bullshit. Um, anyway, so, um, but anyway, so we're kind of like one of the quickest ways to, uh, to remember. And people tend to learn about 44 words an hour. Um, and, um, and yeah, and after kind of five years, we're really beginning to scale quite nicely. So we've got, um, we've kind of recently passed through um, a million monthly active users and um, being a grandiose startup, we're now thinking, okay, 10 million, 100 million, <laughs> um, which I think we can do actually because we are mainly in the um, US and UK at the moment. Um, for a long time, uh, we kind of looked at having an active user in every country in the world and the country of Chad, which is one of those two, I believe, um, uh, was persistently resistant to having a memorized user, but recently we uh, cleared that up. Uh, and so uh, that's good. Um, yeah, and we've just been made sort of editor's choice on um, Google Play, which is sort of 65 apps on the whole app store. Um, and so that's quite nice. So we're gonna um, grow a bit more now. However, like where we've got to is kind of, um, it's kind of still a bit dry. It's not really quite as joyful as we're kind of aiming for. Um, and then there's this great quote by Goethe, which I've actually doctored so as not to be sexist. I think the original was something like, um, uh, no matter, his talents, uh, a, a man will only remain just half a man, let him discover a woman or the world, and then he'll become whole. Um, anyway, um, I think this is a sort of um, a, uh, a kind of profound thing, and the, the kind of danger with learning, and this is obviously in the extreme case of this is learning binary numbers, is that all the satisfaction is kind of inward facing and kind of, you know, basically sort of um, quasi sort of, yeah, just in, in, inward facing, it's just like the satisfaction of forming your memories and cognition and the rest of it, whereas the actual joy of learning is through connection with the world. Um, and at this point, um, I'm going to do a brief excursion on the topic of uh, memory in perception. So we think, tend to think of memory as like a storehouse in the middle of the brain. But in fact, like memory infuses what we see. Um, it structures our visual and all of our perception much more than one can ever quite grasp because of the strength of the metaphor of like information coming in and afterwards being recognized. Um, and... Um, you kind of get a sense of um, how important memory is for perception. By the way, I, I, it's not Shutterstock. I, I was going to thank our sponsors for allowing me to steal their images unattributed. For, um, um, but you know, if you imagine kind of holding a wine bottle in your hand, um, the kind of the sensory input is just some pressure on your hand, and yet you have, despite the fact that you've got this quite simple um, restricted sensory input on just a part of your body, a sense of the bottle, its shape and size. Um, well beyond what you're actually in contact with. Um, so it's as if uh, in your hand you have the kind of some implicit knowledge that were you to move your other hands and touch the rest of it, you come into contact with, with further, further stimulation. The stimulation could be exactly the same if you were holding just a very heavy bottle top. You know, or very, very, very heavy broom, or so, or, you know, a very light broom. <laughs> um, anyway, but the uh, but the perceptual experience is completely different because of the set of expectations you have. Um, and you know, I spent sort of five or six years studying cognitive science, and this was the most interesting and profound experiment I ever came across. And it's not actually that relevant to this talk, but I wanted to tell you about it very quickly. Just make a note if you can, because this is the kind of thing. If you were put in ten years of solitary confinement, just considering the philosophical consequences of this experiment would keep you pretty busy and you, you come out healthy and chirpy and with lots of things to say. So um, this is a guy called Paul Barkey Rita, who's an Israeli cognitive scientist who created this system made of uh, vibrating pins um, with 10 by 10 grids. And basically, he, um, he'd put glasses onto people if they were blind or, or blindfolded and with a very simple sort of black and white camera. 
And that visual input was transformed into um, basically tickling on their backs. Basically, sort of, you know, if there was a bright light in the top left hand corner, it would go da 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 da, top left corner. If there was a bright light in the bottom right hand corner, it would go da 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 da. And so it transformed the um, visual image into tactile form. And what he found when people were trained on this was that, um, was that uh, if they weren't controlling the camera, um, they'd never gain any sense whatsoever of what this input is about. It would just be a random scratching. But as soon as they're allowed to control the camera so that, you know, let's say there's a light directly in front of them, by moving there, they would feel the, the tactile stimulation move there, and then by moving there, they'd feel the tactile stimulation moving there. They're able to gradually make sense of the stimulation. And after a few tens of hours of practice, they began to have a characteristic 3D visual experience through touch. And so they would experience like a 3D world with looming objects, and they were even able to recognize some objects, um, space, um, constraint, uh, things moving, uh, et cetera, et cetera. They were able to experience this merely through taps on their body. And the second, like, especially extraordinary thing is you can actually separate these four things, put them in different orientations and at different parts of your body, and you can still understand the stimulus. So you could have this one here on your chest, this one here on your arm, this one on your thigh, and so on. And so this completely scrambled random input through the... <laughs> Everyone's like, what the fuck is he talking about? Um, this completely scrambled random input is, um, is then through memory, effectively, through sensory motor interaction with the world and through knowledge of the consequences of movement on stimulation transformed into a 3D visual experience. And so when we think of information and perception, we tend to think of like the input beyond all else. But here's an example where the input uh, can be totally scrambled in a different modality, uh, cutting something totally different. And because of an experience of sensory motor contingencies, it can resolve itself into phenomenologically, into subjectively, um, more or less exactly the same thing you get from vision. Anyway, so I hope some of you get put in solitary confinement for a while so you can actually drink that one in. Um, so after over the last um, few uh, weeks, um, I've been kind of collecting examples of um, memory interfering with perception. And I just want to give you some of the examples, because if you look out for this kind of thing, it's super interesting. So the other day, I was in a very bumpy cab in the back. It was a rainy day, and there were all these traffic lights and the rest of it. And I was talking to somebody, and then out of the corner of my eye, I could swear that I saw a beach ball bouncing around, which turned out to be a traffic light. Um, that's it. Good. Um, then I was looking out of a window, and I was, I was admiring this white cow. Um, it wasn't that one. It was an example. It was, uh, it was a white cow. And then it, can we all do this? Can you all look at about this part of the wall over here? And I'm just going to put an animation on. So just look over there. And uh, no one cheat. And I'm going to... Now, what did you all perceive? Oh, what was that? A cow running, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly, that's exactly what I perceived. Um, and we're just going to do that one again. Um, and, uh, yeah, I was like, my God, what an incredibly fast cow. <laughs> and um, it turned out to be a white van um, driving through the field, which is kind of, it was kind of fascinating. So it's like, you can see it's very, very contextual, very, very... Um, very specific to the scene in which I was thinking, and, and it was my sense of shock, <laughs> um, which um, that the, the, a cow could go so fast, which made me sort of go like that, which just shows how that even in the tissue of your implicit expectations about the perceptual world, you have this very kind of subtle knowledge, which, is, uh, which transforms what you experience. I'll give you some, a few more examples. I was having um, an English breakfast in a cafe, which happened to have a disco ball. Um, and anyway, I was called up to do something and maybe get a coffee or something. And then when I came back, I, was, I saw my computer. I was like, oh, no. I, and I thought that I'd spilled scrambled egg all over my computer. But it turned out that it was just the <laughs> flex of the disco light on, on the thing. Um, the other day, I could swear that I saw a, um, someone in a wheelchair with a halo. Um, but it turned out just to be the sun catching the top of their crutches. Um, and there was, they were kind of circular crutches or whatever, so the, yeah, interesting. Um, and then, again, I was, uh, was wandering around my house in the dark, and then I stepped into what I could have sworn was a puddle. Uh, and I was like, oh, fuck. And it turned out just to be a, a very cold plastic bag. Um, and then, um, most weirdly of all, I was just going on a train the other day, and I was deeply tired. I hadn't really slept in uh, a day or two. And um, I could have sworn that I saw a lion reading a newspaper. <laughs> in, in a, anyway, all of these are examples of how um, 
in different ways, memory and our understanding of context interfuses with perception, and that when we actually experience something, what we're, I mean, what we're mainly experiencing is fundamentally the kind of the tissue of kind of expectation and context and, um, and kind of, um, and triggered memory, finally, previous experience, as it's called out by um, in sort of, um, in, um, what's the, in kind of resonance with the world. There's this kind of deep connection. Okay, end of interlude. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that. So yeah, so going back to Goethe. Um, oh, yeah. So um, we might need, let's see if we can get some volume. Um, so this is, um, we, you know, we're, we're very keen at Memorize to create um, an experience which isn't just like ruthlessly effective and helps you learn really, really fast, but which is like authentically joyful and the kind of thing you'd actually do for fun and the kind of thing which makes you fall in love, not just with your mind, but also the world. So uh, you can fall in love with your mind memorizing binary digits. In fact, it's actually quite thrilling. You're like, one, zero, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one, one. But it's a bit lame. Um, better to fall in love with the world. So we are, are gradually kind of transforming memorize to have much more focus on the world, and we've got a couple of things going. And this is our new um, App Store uh, video made by um, uh, Diana, our Ukrainian filmmaker. Um, it's, it's a bit, bit, bit of fun, a bit of a, bit of a rest from me. Yeah, so that, that, that's, that, that's, that, that's kind of the kind of um, the experience we want to make of learning. Um, and um, the specific project we have um, at the moment is to build um, a kind of um, um, basically like a video dictionary of the world's languages and to turn the learning experience from one of um, kind of learning words and phrases and grammar and so on and so forth into a kind of a kind of a, an experience of a kind of a road trip. Um, and um, and uh, yeah, I think this is uh, really beautiful and really exciting. And um, I'm going to show you. I, I did a screencast of uh, my phone on the new mode, which we're launching later this month, um, last night. But unfortunately, I didn't have the audio. So I had to try and, in order to answer the questions, I had to lip read, which I wasn't that good at. But it did give me an idea for a new learn mode um, down the line. Um, anyway, so this is roughly um, how it, So that's the Memorize app. And you type, I'm going to go into video immersion. Um, and so you've got to translate that. Uh, I'm in the middle of French. J'ai faim. J'ai faim. Le. And, and one of the things you're going to notice here is just how unbelievably Le. French. Très French bien. Très bien. Fatigué. <laughs> Fatigué. Fatigué. Tu es. Je suis malade. I think this is where my lip reading really began to break down. Je suis malade. La faim. La faim. Moi. Moi. Très bien. There's Machid inviting me to something. <laughs> Très bien. La faim. And so, yeah, it's a mixture of tests. La so fin. you're um, doing dictation and you're translating and the rest of it. Tu vas. Um, by the way, we have sorted out the audio since we've taken these French ones. Um, and tu uh, vas. Um, so there's me getting points. 1080. I'm chasing my CTO at the moment. Um, Je vais très bien. Anyway, it carries on. But um, <laughs> this is um, that's the kind of the experience we're looking to um, create where. Um, you're learning really fast and the rest of it, but you're kind of getting a really rich, deep contact with the world you're actually learning about. Um, and yeah, as I say, I mean, one of the things uh, that I experienced while doing it, it's just like how unbelievably French French people are and how unbelievably Danish Danish people are. And basically, it kind of, it, it, you know, in our view and what we're kind of hoping when we kind of launch this later in the month, that it will really bring out um, what's beautiful about learning a language, namely making friends, meeting people, um, and just encountering a fundamentally alien but rather amusing and kind of beautiful culture.
Um, anyway, so we've got to c go collect tens of thousands of videos of native speakers in context. So we bought this uh, double-decker bus, and um, we painted it, uh, you know, and our designer is France's greatest Banksy impersonator, who, uh, <laughs> really, who, um, who, um, who once tweeted, Banksy's in Paris, and did links to loads of fake Banksy's he'd done, and it trended on French Twitter, and Banksy almost revealed himself to deny it, and the rest of it. So it was quite, quite funny. But anyway, so, so we got this member, so, and we are... Um, uh, we're going to go on a, um, a kind of European road trip next year, um, and this is the rough itinerary. Um, and um, this is a very, very good Python script for optimized road trips, um, which didn't take into account the quite important ferry journey from Stockholm to Tallinn, which, uh, which is going to save us a bunch of time. Um, but, um, but yeah, so we're going to go around Europe um, on, on, on the Membus, and we're going to collect um, video dictionaries of all these languages um, and like infuse the app with some of the beauty and joy of the uh, world. So and we're doing a Kickstarter next month for this, by the way, so uh, please uh, contribute. And if any of you want to come on the Membus, I imagine that it's going to be basically the most fun ever had. Um, so, um, uh, but you will be put to work. Um, anyway, so yes, we're going to collect 100,000 videos. That's our aim of like native speakers in context. Just these very short native videos, but elaborating it into conversations and so on and so forth. Um, and um, with this, we're, um, we're hoping that we're going to succeed in the sort of the mission of making learning genuinely joyful. Um, and uh, yes, I can't um, help but uh, take this opportunity to say that if any of you happens to be like um, uh, a gifted product designer, you are a UX designer, the rest of it, we are um, hiring for those positions. So, uh, so do, uh, do get in touch, ed at memorize.com. Um, and uh, yeah, um, that is, uh, that's that. So thank you very much.